Welcome to Technovation. I'm your host, Peter High. Our broadcast today comes from our recent Meta Strategy Digital Symposium. The topic was optimizing value delivery through digital and technology capabilities. And the panelists who spoke about this topic were Anita Klopfenstein, Chief Information Officer of Little Caesars, and Kirk Ball, the Chief Information Officer of Giant Eagle. The gentleman who led the conversation was Meta Strategy partner and East Coast lead, Alex Kraus, who joins me now. Alex, welcome. Uh, thank you so much, Peter. I'm excited to be here. Great. Well, Alex, I, I mentioned the topic is optimizing value delivery through digital and technology capabilities. Uh, I wanted to give you a chance to, here at the outset to talk a bit about why that topic was meaningful for us to tackle at our digital symposium and why Anita and Kirk were appropriate personifications of the topic. Uh, so what we wanted to talk about and really continue the conversation about is how technology organizations, uh, so the organizations that are represented by their leaders here, really increasingly drive the value proposition uh, to internal customers, external customers, and end users uh, through technology and digital capabilities. Uh, but interestingly, they don't just do that on a transaction by transaction, one-time basis, but they do this uh, as far as shaping recurring uh, experiences, relationships, and also measuring and improving those over time. Uh, and uh, I'm very excited to be joined uh, by uh, two very seasoned uh, CIOs here. Uh, let me uh, um, introduce uh, to you Anita Klopfenstein. She's the CIO of uh, Detroit-based Little Caesars, a uh, $4 billion revenue uh, company, the third largest pizza company in the US uh, with um, locations in over 20 countries uh, in the world. Prior to Little Caesars, Anita was the Vice President of E-Commerce and Consumer Systems at Panera Bread. Also joining us is Kirk Ball. Uh, Kirk is the uh, CIO at Giant Eagle. Uh, Giant Eagle is uh, also a privately owned $9 billion supermarket and retail chain with more than 36,000 uh, employees and in 470 locations across many U.S. states. Prior to Giant Eagle, uh, Kirk was a technology leader at uh, a healthcare company and at Kroger. Thank you for that overview. Well, let's get to the topic itself. Again, optimizing value delivery through digital and technology capabilities with Anita Klopfenstein of Little Caesars and Kirk Ball of Giant Eagle with Meta Strategy Zone, Alex Kraus. Wonderful. Um, so first thing we wanted to talk about, Anita, if I can turn to you, uh, I think it was really interesting when you shared that your team has really found many different ways to better align with business objectives and operational needs at the same time, and also make sure that you improve the measurement of those and the success uh, and progress uh, along the way. And I was wondering if you can tell us a little bit uh, how you went about that and also what your key insights were. Sure. Um, when, when I joined Little Caesars, they have so many projects going on and the projects are being pri prioritized by who called the developer, right, and, and pleaded their case. So one of the things that we did was we kind of, we centralized everything. We met with the business. We worked on, here's how we prioritize. We did business cases. We educated them on how to do an ROI. Uh, and then we pulled together what we call our IT steering committee. And from there, we review all the requests and the roadmaps. And we just, it was helped us make sure we were working on the right things to move, move the business forward. Uh, we are also fortunate to have a seat at the table uh, with our, our senior leadership team and, and our strategic planning so that we can make sure we understand as we look forward to where we want to be five, 10 years down the road, that we understand what those IT needs are. Um, and the benefit is that as we are now completing projects on time, maybe somewhat on budget, um, but actually working on the things that matters for our stores and our colleagues and our customers. Excellent. And one of the things that you mentioned as well was uh, this uh, included the IT's ability and your ability to say no to the business. And I, I just wonder uh, how you went about that and how that no became, uh, you know, a, a, an informed decision and not just uh, an opinion. Well, one of the things that we did, we did, we educated all of our IT colleagues that they could say no. We wrote a script for them, mm -hmm. literally showed them the words to say, this is, I think your idea is fabulous. Let me help you go through the process of getting your request approved and prioritized so I can work on it. Um, and if that didn't help nudge the business in the right directions, I literally pulled the phones out of the developer's cube so they didn't um, weren't getting calls anymore. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. And, and Kirk, I want to turn to you. We talked a little bit about data and analytics uh, already. And uh, what I found interesting um, when I heard uh, about your, your past experiences and successes at, uh, at John Eagle is kind of how some of the 
you know, um, digital capabilities or advancements that were really partly driven uh, by the pandemic that shaped so many uh, digital advancements and acceleration was the use of data and analytics, uh, specifically as far as uh, personaliz personalization is concerned, but also to really shape the, uh, the experience that's both a physical in-store experience as well as a uh, virtual experience. And I wonder if you can tell a little bit about, about like what you found, how you went about that and uh, what successes you saw. Yes, certainly. Thank you. Um, yeah, look, at the end of the day, during the pandemic, uh, there were a lot of things that were in flux that were changing customers' buyer habits, their taste, their preferences, the way that they wanted to buy uh, and interact with us. So obviously, uh, we had to make sure that we were uh, we were receiving the signaling on almost a real-time basis, and we were adjusting uh, the goods and services in the way that we were taking them to market. So whether it was understanding how people were trading down in terms of what goods that they, they bought prior to, prior to the pandemic and what they were buying afterwards and adjusting prices real time, whether it be uh, understanding macro level uh, movement of product and identifying and then working with our suppliers on what product we needed to make sure we had on shelves mm -hmm. based upon changing customer demands during the pandemic. Uh, and then certainly the uh, advent and the acceleration of the digital interaction with the enterprise. Uh, we were uh, real time in the midst of rolling out, I'll say uh, what we call our curbside buy online pickup store delivered to home. And uh, obviously that dramatically exploded. And so we had to figure out how to roll that out to other uh, stores as we were in the midst of that rollout. We accelerated the rollout. And for the stores where we had done the rollout, we also expanded the number of slots. So. Uh, certainly the analytics and figuring out what number of slots we could have open at what locations during what time frames, the volume that we could serve, and so running all of that math. And then certainly a lot of analytics in the background in terms of supply chain. Uh, what's, what's the demand? What are the changing preferences? What's the changing demand patterns? And then how do we reflect that information back to our suppliers, make sure we have the right product on the right shelf, at the right store, at the right time? Uh, and then certainly last but not least, and you said of personalization, the ability to customize the experience to drive promotions that are personalized to the changing preferences of our customers. It's massively important that we don't just give them promotions on anything, but that we give them promotions on things that matter to them, right? That's what they care about. And so uh, those are some, uh, those are some, certainly some ways in which we uh, used analytics and used information, and used data. Uh, to uh, accommodate certainly the demands that were placed on us during the pandemic. And clearly we continue to uh, use those techniques as we, uh, as we go throughout uh, post-pandemic uh, timeframes. Wonderful, great. And, and both of you spoke to the, uh, to the need and importance of uh, success and progress measurement already. I, I wonder if we can stay uh, on, the, on that uh, topic a little bit. Uh, Anita, you, uh, you were kind enough to share uh, with us uh, some of the ways in, you, uh, in which you use uh, success measurement and, and tracking specifically for innovative and cool ideas. And I think you have an effort, uh, I think you termed this Area 51 actually, uh, but uh, you shared some examples and I, I, I hope you can share them with the audience now uh, in terms of what you found, how you went about this and what a difference made. Yeah, we, we have our, our huge systems, our store platforms, our POS, our make line for where we make the pizzas, where we land them and put them in boxes and set them in the portals. So those are very core, have to be up 99.999% of the time. So what we did is we wanted to be able to innovate and look for ways to uh, automate our production lines, to reduce labor, reduce waste in our stores. So we created a smaller group, uh, and we did refer to it as Area 51, <laughs> where we come up with a lot of different innovations that uh, we haven't productionized yet, so we might put them into a few stores to test them out to see if, if they'll be profitable. We always go in with, we will be successful if this um, Area 51 project does X. Uh, so whether that be increase the transactions that we can flow through a store uh, to improve our customer experience, and we have those measurements and so what we do is we kind of duct tape those solutions together. We test them in a store with a franchisee who's very patient with new technology and willing to deal with the hiccups. And then if it's if it works well, we productionalize a little bit more, roll it out a little bit more, and then we, we get it to where if it truly meets all of those success measures, 
uh, then we'll roll it out system wide. I'm excited to hear that duct tape is used even in a sophisticated technology department. Uh, Anita, um, uh, Kirk mentioned it earlier as well, but the, the relationship between technology and operations, and you used a, a few examples as critical. Kirk spoke, spoke about supply chain specifically, um, but, but can you tell a little bit about how like little changes can make big differences? Oh, very much so. Uh, we actually have all of our IT staff um, are highly suggested to go work periodically in a store a couple times a year so they can actually see what they have built and how it's impacting the stores. And there were there have been several cases where just moving a, a button from one side of the screen to another to help with the, the bumping of a product uh, really impacted the operations of the store. You wouldn't think that that would be so critical, mm -hmm. but it was. Uh, the other one is that we made our POS system that we're rolling out currently for our stores, we made it very mobile ordering like. So, mm -hmm. and by doing that, we reduced the training time to use that for a cashier from about two to three days to 15 minutes, wow. which we had to prove by making my husband use the uh, POS system in front of about 2,000 business. Uh, folks during a business that's, conference. That's great. And I, I learned I learned that not only is uh, pepperoni an 80% of pizzas, uh, but I also learned that you make heavy use of uh, in-store and on location the technologies like cameras um, and so forth. Is that right? Yes. What we like to do with, with cameras is we can check for quality of the pizza and we can yep. kick that out. If the pizza doesn't meet our quality, we can say, does it meet? Remake it. And that way we're keeping that line going very well. Uh, we also can use cameras to measure where our lobbies are uh, mm -hmm. as far as how many people are in the lobbies. And that can help us learn how to better do our labor transactions and, and scheduling to make sure we have enough folks in the store. Excellent. Excellent. Kirk, so we, we talked about uh, customer experience. We talked employee experience and data and analytics. And what was really interesting, uh, you have an interesting perspective on the relationship between data and analytics uh, and the employee experience. And I was wondering if you can tell us a little bit about that. And, and how you see this uh, relationship evolving. Sure, before I do that though, I just wanna highlight what Anita said. I was just looking at the poll of measuring value contribution. Yeah. It is, it is so important when you, at the beginning of a project that you ask the people on the assembly line that are gonna use the product, get them involved right up front in defining so true, yeah. what the right thing to do is, and then ask your team members, we do the same thing. We have them go out and use what they built. They get a chance to see it uh, in real world use and they can see uh, they walk a mile in the uh, shoes of the folks who are actually going to use those systems. Certainly, you know, we work uh, very diligently from a digital and an in-store experience perspective to make sure that we're working to massively eliminate friction for our customers and those yeah. guests that we serve. Uh, but at the same time, uh, there's another half of the equation. Uh, as it relates to uh, you know an incredible an incredible experience for our consumers and that is our team members mm -hmm. uh, and we need to make sure that we're giving them tools data insights uh, on the operations of the store where is there an out of stock uh, where is uh, has the number as one of your top ten percent of your customers walked in the store maybe you can go greet them right uh, ask them if there's anything you can do for them so how do we uh, provide uh, application capability, data insights that allows the team member to provide world-class service and create an experience that creates competitive differentiation. We have to make sure that we're not only providing capability and eliminating friction for our customers and our guests, but we are eliminating uh, friction and adding uh, incredible value for our team members. They want to provide a world-class experience. It's our responsibility to work with them to hear their thoughts and to arm them with the tools and the capability and the data that allows them to unleash the potential that they have and their desire to serve uh, the customer in a world-class way. That, that's great. And I love this, uh, this thought about competitive differentiation through the tools and the data that you make available to them so they can serve the customer. That's, that's pretty, pretty powerful. I think uh, you also make use of technology as far as training is concerned, right? You. Uh, you use uh, technology to, to make the training experience better, uh, to make the training more meaningful. Can you can you speak about that a little bit? Yes, yeah, certainly we do. And we're trying to make sure that we give uh, the opportunity for associates and team members to uh, execute training in snippets that they can absorb very quickly, very easily, and absorb it 
at the point of action. So uh, we're running one minute to two minute videos. Uh, anywhere that they want to run those videos, they're specific to the activities that they need to make sure that they're proficient mm -hmm. on. And so they can utilize their uh, mobile device that they have uh, available to them. And they get one to two minute snippets at that point of action so that they can, in the real world, they can be contextualizing what they're uh, looking at mm -hmm. and then actually execute that training uh, in the particular area, particular department that they're in. It's massively impactful. You're not giving them four hours of training and then they have to, and then they're sitting in a classroom. You're giving them uh, training and snippets that are easy to, and quick to absorb. And it's in the, it's in the actual real world experience that they have to execute those skills. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, Anita, uh, quickly back to you in terms of, uh, you know, the same, the measurement of success uh, shared between uh, business and technology. How do you go about communicating to, to the people uh, on location in the stores uh, what they're really working for, uh, not just the paycheck, but in terms of the overarching team and, and, and corporate goals? How do you go about that? Uh, we do take advantage, a lot of advantage of online. So we have webinars for the employees. We're providing mm -hmm. not only our employees, but our franchisees and their employees here. Here are our standards. Here's the stats. Here's the best way to make this particular pizza. Uh, our POS actually, as the stores are um, working, we're showing stats up online of how uh, the company is doing as, mm -hmm. and where that particular store lands as a little bit of a competitive fund. Uh, and then we also, a lot of times, they're, they're, they are competing for some fun swag. If we're running a particular uh, uh, limited time offer, like right now, Call of Duty or with the NFL, we, we give hats and shirts and things of that nature. So we do just try to keep it light and entertain. I realize that most of our uh, employees in the stores are between the ages of, you know, 15 and, and 20. And uh, we have to retrain them. Virtually, we turn those over every year. So just trying to, you know, make it a easy, fun environment uh, and use, utilizing our systems to, to communicate with them has is, is, is been a key for us. That's great. That's great. Kirk, if I remember correctly, you were speaking about how you uh, developed and refined your technology strategy. And the first thing, of course, you said, you tie it back to the enterprise, the business strategy. But what I found particularly uh, uh, intriguing is you said it's not your strategy, it's really your team's strategy. And talked a little bit about the co-creation of strategy. Can you can you explain that to your colleagues um, on, on this call? Sure. I think the thing, and Anita mentioned a little bit, kind of the concept, and it's allowing your team members to contribute to the success of the organization, the success of the enterprise, and the success of the technology group. Look, we are on a, a massive transformation journey from a business and a technology perspective. In parallel, as our business partners, we're going through a business uh, transformation roadmap development strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, we partnered up with them, and in parallel, we did a technology roadmap strategy as well. So we have a three to five year window that ladders up directly connected discipline by discipline, whether it's merchandising, marketing, supply chain. We have a parallel strategy that matches and ladders up to the specific business initiatives that they want to uh, be able to execute and deliver over the next three to five years. So you have uh, you have alignment and your business partners, uh, you've joined in conjunction with your business partners to do that. The other thing that I think has been massively imp impactful is it's not my strategy, it's <laughs> our strategy. And so asking your team members to contribute and helping develop that technology strategy uh, is incredibly important. They begin to get a sense of ownership and they begin to get invested. And so it's not like I came down from on high with three tablets and said, here's what we're gonna do, right? Uh, I said, look, here's what our business partners are trying to transform and do. Let's collectively put our heads together. Let's get some key members of the team and let's uh, let's get lots of folks input and, and, and uh, perspective. Uh, because again, they deal day to day, not just with senior leaders, but they deal with the people that are using the technology that they deliver. So it's incredibly important to uh, get their perspective too. And so now we have ownership. People uh, across the whole technology organization, they're invested in our strategic roadmap. They understand it. They understand how it ladders up to the business initiatives. Uh, so there's a, there's a vision and there's a strategic uh, path to execution that everybody understands. And they had a chance to contribute to it. And it's been massively impactful. That's fantastic. I, I hope you can maintain that and, and keep those uh, strategies and roadmaps and lockstep. That's, that's great. 
Uh, Nita, as we before we wrap up, uh, you you both have a tremendous experience in your respective roles and in technology leadership, uh, more generally speaking. But but specifically on the topic of business and technology alignment, are there any particular pieces of advice that uh, that would, you would give your yourself uh, early in the career or other technology uh, leaders who are aspiring uh, to to the position that you are both in in terms of what does it take? What is something you would like to avoid or? or or is there one thing that you would do differently or, or, or say that people do or just like as you did? Oh, I think for me, the piece of advice that I got early in my career, and, and I, 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 I try to get everyone to think that way, a project is always going to be harder than you think. It's <laughs> going to cost more than you think, and it's going to take longer than you think. Mm -hmm. So I, I work with my team to always make sure that we are giving more of a range of estimates and not mm -hmm. absolutes. Uh, as well as to ensure that every release has kind of a mix of new technology, new features, functionality, technical debt, and just fixing the bugs. And uh, and I always try to get them to leave that agile sprint bucket about 20% empty because something's always going to happen to fill it up. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but that, that typically has helped me to try to, to hit our timelines in a, in a reasonable fashion. So, so Anita's version of the Iron Triangle, maybe just not so so tough as, as Iron yeah. Office. Kirk, Kirk, just to wrap us up, anything uh, in, in that same vein that, that you would recommend or specifically maybe even to a uh, business stakeholder expectation management? How do you how do you go about that? What would what kind of advice would you give uh, to, to someone else? Look, I expect my uh, myself and the folks that I work with in the technology discipline, we get out on a regular basis with our, our key business partners. And we walk a mile in their shoes. We'll go on ride-alongs. We'll go into stores. We'll go into distribution centers. Uh, we spend time with our merchandising folks, our marketing folks. We seek to understand what are the challenges and the objectives they're trying to obtain. Mm -hmm. And then we partner up with them and help them understand we are here to help you achieve what you're trying to achieve. Uh, and we will do our very best. And what that does is it not only allows you to understand things from their perspective and make sure you have alignment in terms of what you deliver, mm -hmm. but I've also found that it gives you um, a relationship where they will start to ask your opinion, right? And it starts to give you the opportunity to say, well, there's technology maybe that's coming out that could totally disrupt the way that you're thinking about doing this. And it gives you a right uh, to be a partner. And that's incredibly impactful. That's fantastic. The right to be a partner. I like that a lot. Well, thank you so much. I know both of your organizations and you and your teams are incredibly busy, especially during this holiday season. So thank you for having made time uh, for, for the session today. Best of luck. And uh, I hope to see you again uh, in this forum or in a different setting. Thank you. Thank you.